Hi, Kiko. Welcome Hello. to Show Studio. Thank you very much. And um, welcome to our Reese series. Um, we're going to be talking about your Spring Summer 18 collection, but I just want to check in with you at the moment because I know you're working with Macintosh, you're their creative director for, the, for their subline. Um, how's things with you? Are you straight on to the next collection or have you got a bit of time to breathe? No time to breathe. Try to, <laughs> trying to wrap up Spring 18 for both and then straight into the next collection. So it's no time. No time at no all. No time. Okay, well, we can use this time to reflect and chill, hopefully, yeah, give you a bit of a breather. Um, I want to jump straight in and talk about um, the references for your, for your Spring Summer 18 collection because they were super visual, super kind of filmic. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, kind of David Lynch's Lost Highway. Yeah. And tell me a bit about that and where that. Um, well, the way we started with this new collection was more, um, the, first of all, the way I work is usually looking at the last season and judging what went wrong, what mm -hmm. I wasn't happy with it. Um, so, so far, um, spring 17, winter 18, uh, clothes-wise, product-wise, I've been very happy, but then the features from the previous season, I wasn't particularly happy the way my work was shown, and you couldn't really see the time spent on creating the pieces, working on the cuts, working on development. So uh, it was very personal as well. It was more about me and my character and people around me. Mm -hmm. So for Spring 18, we really wanted to make it more, and it was our first show, so we really wanted to make it um, show worthy and create a character that we can portray, so that wasn't me. So that's why we opened the references slightly f more, and um, that's why we picked something that is slightly more pop, because the way I've been been told through St. Martin's for the past six, seven years is always to find uh, new references that are almost unknown to mm -hmm. someone else. So that's how you validate your work by presenting it to the tutors or uh, you, you need to come with a new, new, new ideas, new research, uh, create your own research. So we've been doing that for the past three, well, we've been doing that for every collection, but for, um, for this one, it was more okay how people can engage slightly more like easy, easy. Mm -hmm. So that's what we picked um, to build a character that wasn't me. It was more of a fictional character. Uh, so that's why, yeah, we're looking to a few cinematic references. One of it was um, David Lynch, Lost Highway, and mainly The Mystery Man. Mm -hmm. um, and then we look also in uh, Manhunter. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we combine both of them and the, the characters um, into one, uh, the austerity, the, the coldness, the sinister, so that really inform the clothing as well, the set and the music in every aspect of the show. Uh, so. Yeah, it did have this super eerie aesthetic from the minute you walked in. Yeah. Um, I know Thomas Petherick did your set, didn't he? Yeah. Can you talk to me about... Um, like were your brief for him, how did you say, did you got, come to him with David Lynch imagery or did, did you come to him with the character? What came first? Um, to be completely honest, uh, we got the space maybe two weeks before the show. So okay. it was very, <laughs> um, we, knew about, we knew about the space, we didn't confirm it. We, we initially thought to do, again, back to the old season, the images was very dark, the ceiling was very low, mm -hmm. it was like a black, black box and it just could, didn't feel like, a, didn't felt giving any justice to my work. So um, we looked into a lot of locations. One of it was a penthouse in London Bridge with uh, just ceilings, uh, ceilings, um, I mean like glass walls. So there mm -hmm. was no, um, it was very bright daylight. So we, the whole idea was to create this penthouse for, for the character. So when you walked in, you have the music and it yeah, feels very eerie with the, with the collection, uh, but unfortunately this location wasn't perfect for the time, for the amount of guests we wanted, so we ended up in 180 Strand in the basement, which is, uh, it's been used only two times for fashion shows, mm. um, but it's a massive space, so we had to really... Yeah, it was a good space. Um, we had to actually build all the walls that you see, so it actually the space is 10 times bigger than what, 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 what you saw, um, and the main, point in the space was the lift. 
um, with the red ace on it. It's like a marble lift that it used to be the mainly for the building. So the moment we saw the space, I knew this is the, I want this as a backdrop. So we work really hard creating the the set around it, all the benches where the walls are, the second room, and also the lighting. So it looks like a background uh, because it could easily be in, the lift could reflect and not look as... Uh, you, the A's were there when you were there? The A's, these A's yeah, on the, the walls? they're part of the building. They're part yeah, of the building? Yeah, I thought they were part of the... No. Uh, that's brilliant. I was actually thinking to remove them because we had options to actually take them out mm -hmm. because uh, they don't really mean anything. They're just there, they've been marked. Uh, and also you can see a lot of the, the marble is kind of falling, falling down. Uh, so we had, we had options to actually tear some of it down if we wanted to. So yeah, it was, it was very considered the way the m models walked. So in the photos, you can still see the lift. The lights are actually our own lights. So when you see it in the photos, you see the, mm. um, the, the side light to, to create this cinematic reference, which everything was briefed to the light technician. All the movies were given to, to, to assure the, the imagery that we receive later is translating to the character. So even if you're not in the show, you still can, can feel what... Yeah, so you know just by looking at it that yeah. okay. there's these, it, it was super lynching when you walked in and then you sat on the chairs, which were super cold, and then that game, immediately everyone was like, oh God, what's going to happen? And the music, of course, yeah, everything was very... For example, the music we worked maybe three weeks on it, uh, and we built a lineup based on the music. So each look, there was uh, parts of the music where there's, a, for example, white look, then you have uh, the long coat. So it was very much, right. each second was had to be balanced <laughs> with, the, with the look. Um, so it, it had to be right. It had to be like absolutely perfect. So, um, and Lynch, I think it's, <laughs> it's strange. I, as I said before, when, when you come from St. Martin's for so many years, references like this are almost a no-go. They you, you can't come in and be like, okay, I'm looking. And Lost Highway is my only David Lynch film that I've seen. I haven't seen Twin Peaks. I haven't seen none of the other movies. Mm -hmm. And I've seen Lost Highway maybe five months ago. So <laughs> where, did it, where did that come from? Well, I was talking a lot with my friends how I wanted to build the character because the character didn't come from David Lynch movie. The character came from last season, me sitting at home watching Netflix and just watching a lot of crime series. And uh, it just, for me, it kind of struck me, you're at Sunday at 2 p.m. in London watching these movies as entertainment. Mm. Uh, and for me, it was like, okay, how I want, that's why I want to portray a dark character in Bright Space, which didn't really happen. Uh, but that was the initial starting point. So then it came, how can you be a sinister, austere character and who is the best people to look at? So my friend suggested you should watch Lost Highway. And then that was the only one I watched. I was like, okay, that's enough. I don't want to watch any <laughs> I'm done. I, I don't, I don't want to watch anymore because I was afraid I would get too influenced by it. And that's, what you mean. that's why we, we divided the character actually between Manhunter and uh, Lost Highway. So you have, um, you have the darkened lips and uh, the bleach. No, yeah, they, we had to bleach all the eyebrows of so the models and then we put the stocking um, so that you can see both characters blend into one. Super creepy, <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> it was a fine balance between being a character and being a destruction of the clothes because the main focus is always the, the clothes. Um, so. uh, let's talk about the clothes then. So, <laughs> um, so you kind of had, um, it's, a lot of your work is based on kind of utilitarian uniform. Yeah. Um, this kind of felt like your character's uniform kind of, I don't want to say your character's a murderer, but he does give off that. Mm essence <laughs> no i mean yeah we, that was the tricky bit was how do you portray a sinister and austere vibe into the clothes mm. um so that's why even talking about 
my work not being seen before because of the venue, because of the lighting. And also what I learned about is by doing two or three shows, it's you need to really put the work out to be seen. So that's why we had a lot of the, the construction on the outside, the snaps, the darts. The I love the darts. The darts are beautiful. Yeah, we, because sometimes when you put inside, it kind of almost hide. And this, this, this season was, OK, we're going to put out for you to see it. Um, because each season we start from scratch. So mm -hmm. for example, we don't do any carryovers and this season is finished now. Next season is essentially starting from, sta from, from nothing. Uh, we don't carry over trousers or jackets um, for, for now. For is that because you just want a completely fresh look into um, collect a new season? Because I want to build a foundation of, of cutting and patterns and trousers and jackets and the full wardrobe. And I think if we push ourselves five, six seasons, by that sixth season, we'll have so much foundation to work with for later on. Now it's not about doing a retrospective already on, on no, your own that's work. True. Uh, and it's, uh, people say, oh, it's too fast, it's too quick, six, six months. But actually, if you work hard enough, there's enough time to create new stuff and just work on the patterns. Because today it feels like a lot of the time of the designer has been taken by going to events, Going to parties. Not your thing. <laughs> I mean, I would, love, I would love to go if there's someone in my studio doing the work, but there's no I work with four people, which is still quite a lot of mm -hmm. um, team for the, for the time we are now with my company. But I like being there. I want to make sure that we're in a position where we have, you know, like when I talk about it, there's actually physical proof that we're working hard and we're creating this new new garments, new products, so... There's definitely attention to detail. I think one of the notes in the, in your the press, release. press release, thank you, um, was that one of, these pe one of your pieces, Cubic Jacket, took 15 yeah, samples? Yeah, it's the one with the double zip. Um, this one? Yeah, because it's not... The pattern is not mirrored, so you don't have left and right side exactly the same. Mm -hmm. It's completely... 360 jacket. So if you there's so many seams and darts and pleats, uh, that the goal is when you look at it now, you don't really see it. But when you hold it, when you look at the right, when you put it on, then you can actually understand the construction. You're like, okay, I know where I'm, that someone actually spent enough time on this, and I know why I'm paying X amount for it. But the problem with this jacket was if you move one thing to the left, the whole jacket just goes like this. So <laughs> it's it's very balanced operation so it, we had to do a lot of we will do one and it's, it looks good but then we if you want to change something the next one is you start from every single if they're like 20 pieces you, you need to retrace and change every single one right so that was the, the the tricky bit and that's why it took so long and the color palette where did that where did that stem from they've got these kind of acidy yellow and greens mm. Again, I wanted to move away from being just like a one color look, which we did for the past yeah. few seasons where you got that uniform look. So it was more moving into, yeah, how do you cr almost create this color that don't really work together? Mm. Um, so the color palette came from uh, an artist. Uh, Julian Charrier. Yeah. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Future Fossil Spaces. Yeah, it's an exhibition that I saw in Paroso Unit, maybe three years ago. So the moment I saw it, I knew I wanted to do something with it. And I just waited for the right time to come to, to really use it. Um, and also, I will, I will, the goal was to show in actually parasol unit, but they were having exhibition, so we couldn't use the space. Um, so yeah, the colors come from, uh, from the acid water that he used, and also the stone and grace. Yeah. Come. So all of this informed the uh, the whole palette of the collection and the way it was mixed. Um, and this season we try to inform as many fabrics in the same uh, color, so you get that depth. So for example, the green, we have it in five different fabrics, even though it might look like it's only one fabric reused through the show. It comes in a PK, comes in a wool, cotton, another cotton. So you have four different variations, so you can really bring that depth to the collection by not looking the same texture. So yeah. that was really the, the jersey, the PK and the cotton, we did them in eight colors. So we could really 
really kind of bring it together. And about the, about the materials, there's a waterproof, waterproof wool? It's like a rain system, it's like Loro Piano rain system, uh, storm system, so it's, yeah, it, we have three of those fabrics. Um, again, first time using a bit more non-utilitarian fabrics. We still have the twills, which are updated to horizontal rather than vertical twills, and then you have the, the Loro Piana, three Loro Piana, one is wool nylon, wool mohair, and wool lycra, so. Amazing. And where do, you, where do you get the idea for those fabrics from, if you've never used them previously? Oh, we, we just go to the fairs and we see as many, we see thousands of fabrics and then we sit What catches the, your eye? Yeah, just what, what would work. Um, the more doing the collection, the, the fabrics and the colour are where you really need to start with. Even though you don't have any ideas about the silhouettes, it's, you need to order the fabrics because it takes six weeks to get your colour right. Um, because all the colours we did in the collection, they essentially our own colors, so we had to send color referencing from artworks to be matched to that, and then it takes one or two t trials, and it's five, six weeks, and by the time you approve it, then it takes another five weeks, six weeks until it comes, so it, it's a really long process. You really, essentially, now we're looking into colors for next January. Yeah. It's very important. If you really want to have the right color story that reflects your research, you really need to start in really in advance because stock colors, they're not good. They stock for, for a reason. Um, and it's... So did you send them the images of Julian's work and, and they pulled from that? Uh, some of them, but some of them we pant on much everything to the artwork uh, and then we send the pant on colors and then they send you four different grays uh, from for a normal person, all of them look the same, but then you take the force and then you match it back to the artwork or whatever you're referencing, and then, okay, this is the one, and it's just matching it all together with the rest of the colors. And the, the challenging bit is you, you're judging the color and the fabric in a swatch this big. Yeah. Um, and when it comes, you just pray that it will drape the right way <laughs> and it's not gonna be, too light or too stiff, but... Um, Is there any fabrics that you found challenging aside from that jacket? Um, no, the, no, with this one. We missed three fabrics because of timing. There was supposed to be more fabrics, but it just they, they didn't arrive on time, so we had to cancel them, uh, but we found alternatives. Mm. But none of, all the fabrics performed the way we essentially intended them to. Mm. Often you kind of ref reference your parents and their mm. workwear a lot in your collection. Is there anything um, in this particular collection that references your your dad was a builder? Yeah. Um, no, there was this season. There was no much personal apart from me. Just drawing on the character. Yeah, and but funny enough, my dad built all the walls in the show really? with, with his team. Uh, we were we had to build everything in the day of the show. That's amazing. So. They, yeah, He's still a part of them involved. He, they were really involved. They had to build 15 walls in three, four hours. So everything you see on the back that's, that's been built, that's not part of the space. Right. Um, so it was a very kind of eye-opening experience when I walked in today and there was maybe 60 people working on the show, light, um, set build, music, backstage. It was very... It really made me think, okay, this is really, really real. And I was really pleased that the collection actually can stand and hold on its own because yeah. it would be a nightmare if we had shit collection and <laughs> everyone put so much work into making the show and then suddenly you don't, the work is not as good. Yeah. Uh, but I was, I can stand behind it. I'm, I'm pleased with it. So. And you have these, I want to talk about your A6 collaboration. Yes. Uh, I read somewhere that you only wear A6, or you have went through a phase of only wearing A6. Yeah, when I was at St. Martin's, I used to wear just a hat model they don't do anymore. Uh, I had maybe four pairs of it, so just wearing that. Uh, for the past maybe few years, I've been wearing another running shoe brand, but now with, with A6, I'm back, back with them. And <laughs> it's... Um, how did, how did that come about, the collaboration come about? 
you contacted uh, him? They did contact me quite a long time ago, actually, maybe a year ago, mm -hmm. um, which is essentially straight from my graduation. They contacted me, and it's, it's an interesting project because it's the first time they're allowing someone to change their performance shoe, um, and it's a big step for them because it's a performance brand. They have their core customer, and they really they have the values, and they're not... Now they are interested in cooperating more in, in, in fashion, but um, it's, it's a very, very small step because the product performs, it's, a, it's for running. And mm. if we make a product that looks, first of all, heavier and doesn't look like it's gonna perform, then the actual real running customer will question the whole brand. So- I see what you mean. We, yeah, I did, combine four shoes uh, with a new sole that is not out yet and we apply a thin layer of plastic on top so it's it's essentially a new silhouette uh, even though it looks very much like ASICS there's no complete build up on top but it's uh, just the first stage of the collaboration so and how much creative input did you did they come to you, to your studio, or did you go to them? Or we had few meetings. We had few meetings in London. Then the European office in, is in Amsterdam. Um, so it was very easy process, and also all the colors in the shoes are uh, taken from the from the research. Mm -hmm. So there's no we 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 decide every every color to make sure that the looks is complete. Uh, and there's no, if, because you could easily have really bad color combination if you don't give the exact color reference to match the clothes. So the, the shoes were designed around the clothes, which was very important for me. And it wasn't just color change of the existing model and giving them a different, like a Pantone color and suddenly it looks more yellowy or more greeny and then it's, looks like you bought them from Sports Direct, which is not, or they've been given to you, yeah. which is not the idea was. Talk to me about some of the clothes. So we talked about the cubic jacket, but um, I'm interested in these kind of double darts at the back and these collars and the zips up the back of the thigh. Mm. Um, so you still have some of the tailoring is referencing 1920s mm -hmm. tailoring. Um, so it was again looking at what is uh, sinister lean silhouette, which era in fashion that really existed it. So I've been, I did quite extensive research in 1910s, 1920s. It was the silhouette that I was attracted to. So some of the jackets were looking into, into those um, old photos saying, how do you replicate that? So you have 1940s safari jackets that they have, for example, this is from a, like a military jacket on the back, the external darts, mm -hmm. the opening, the way it goes to the two buttons, that's from 1920s. Two buttons. Yeah, and it's, there's no overlap, so it's literally mids on the front. Um, and yeah, that's where some of the silhouettes came in. The external darts was more like, okay, well, I really want to show the, the work, the construction, so it needs to be out uh, yes. instead of hiding it inside. Um, in the back zips of the trousers, that's from a, a contemporary workwear brand where we took some of that and mixed it. So it's essentially a mix between contemporary utilitarian workwear mixed with 1920s, 1930s silhouette and really blending it together. For example, this is the jacket was cut with big side slits, so this is the jumpsuit that comes through. Yeah. Um, so the way we designed the jacket was so it can work with a jumpsuit. So you have the big side slits where you can take your sleeve from the jumpsuit and you can wrap it outside because if you can do it inside and you put your jacket and looks doesn't look doesn't look nice. So the idea was how can you do it so you can. It looks flat and it looks beautiful. On the back, it's again, there's nothing on the, on the previous one. There's no, you can't see the sleeves. They're just on the outside and yeah. they were green so they can cut the body through it. This downside is really amazing, this. It's, it's like a pinch dart, so that goes back to the Tom Burr reference, uh, the artwork where he used like furniture pins and overlaps the fabric and pin it to the wall. 
So I wanted to do a jacket where you can adjust it. So for example, this is adjustable. You can open the snaps and the silhouette change. So it was more even thinking about commercially, like if someone wants to have this show look where it's very, very lean, very fitted, but then in real world, if you have 10 people buying it, only one or two will actually wear it like this. So what about the rest of the eight? What are they going to do? So they can open the jacket and wear it uh, with not such a fit. And also to achieve that, we had to leave the armhole open so it's not completely closed. So if you see on the back, you can see the shirt coming, coming through. It's interesting that you say um, you're thinking of the consumer a lot. Is that something that's really prevalent in everything you're making? Who's wearing this and who's buying the we, designs? Um, the way I design is primarily for me uh, because I, I buy a lot of clothes, I have a lot of clothes, and I respect clothes. Um, and everything we do is, or everything I do is, okay, do I have that? Do I need to make it? Do I have that in my wardrobe? Do I have this trouser in my wardrobe? I have maybe 250 trousers at home. And <laughs> you know, there's different cuts. And so it's like, okay, looking at everything, and how can you make something that I don't essentially, how can I build myself a wardrobe that I don't already have? Um, and if I hit a point where I'm like, okay, actually this exists, I can go and buy it from someone else, then we don't make it. Uh, okay. And that's really, how, how we work at the studio uh, for my collection. It's, and if we hit a point where like, oh, actually there's someone that is making the things that we really, really want to wear, then we'll stop because there's no point making them. I'll just work for, for someone else only and not waste my time and people around me making or well, working hard for these collections. Um, especially there's so much shit out there. So, I mean, it's... It's, I don't know, it's quite, quite funny. My work is driven by what is bad and what's not good. So I think... <laughs> Just, yeah, fair enough. I mean, it's, it's true. It's not like, okay, what is someone else doing? Let's do something similar so it can fit in that. No, that's true. There's no point in doing that. No, and you can, you can have easy life. You just consult for someone else or there's no responsibility. You go and work for someone else and... It's, it's easy, so maybe in a few years, maybe that's what we'll be doing, but right now it's, <laughs> it's more about there's something to say. Uh, yeah. And I think that's the main, the main point. Uh, How do you find working for yourself with your own business? Um, it's hard. Because you do both, don't you? You work for Macintosh. I work for Macintosh, uh, and I work with but do both collections from my own studio and it's it's hard. It's it's been only twelve months since kind of graduating. So building the studio, building the structure, building the business side, um, it takes longer and it's it needs to be as considered as the collection. Um, luckily doing Macintosh really helps me be more free with my own line and just appreciate that I can do whatever I want with my own line. Macintosh, it's, there's a name to it um, and I need to respect that and also it's a different, different brief. Uh, so by the same time, Macintosh, my, my line for Macintosh is very new. It's a, essentially a newborn where we, my own line and Macintosh, they kind of grow at the same pace. Mm -hmm. um, That's true actually. It's, it's, there's no, no one before me there to build a structure, so it's very interesting because we're learning from both, from mine and from Macintosh, and they learn, they learn from me as well, so it's, uh, it takes a long time building these foundations for, to be able to have enough time to do the, to do the creative. Um, <laughs> it pays off, it pays off, it looks amazing. Yeah, I think... You work I mean, incredibly hard. People always ask me, oh, are you happy? Are you enjoying it? And I'm frank, I, I don't enjoy it, I'm not happy because... <laughs> um, no, I didn't say that. No, but if I see it in six months, like, for example, if I see what we achieve in 12 months, yeah, I'm happy. 
Okay, in I terms see of the mean. way it, you don't you don't judge a collection straight after that because you just want to move on, you want to let it go, but you can't really let it go because you spend so much time on it. Um, but I think if you ask, I don't know, Phoebe Philo or whatever, they, if you ask them, are you enjoying it? I'm not sure if they're going to be like, yeah, I'm having so much fun, <laughs> having those meetings every day with 100 people, you know. It's, yeah. uh, but I think if she looks back in the five years, what she achieved, I'm sure she'll be happy. Uh, so I think it's more like looking back than kind of judging the moment. So it's, for me, it's, yeah, let's see in the next, how we're going to escalate in the next 12 months and the 12 months after. Because in my head, um, I think very ahead, I think, I think maybe September 19, I'm kind of planning uh, projects for, for, for that time. Yeah, because you have to, if you really want to take the right steps, you really need to plan them. You can't just wait for them to, to come and just sit and just wait and let's see what's going to happen. It's more trying to be a bit more strategic and seeing where, almost where the, the fashion will go in the next, of months, it just so when you put something out, it's actually relevant rather than outdated. So, yes. Do you look back on this um, happily? With yeah, fondness? I mean, I'm Are actually you pleased with how it was received. Yeah, I'm, as I said before, I wish I was sitting and watching the show because I knew <laughs> everyone worked really, really hard to everyone. We discussed this show pretty much straight after the last one. Uh, we had a meeting with everyone from production, PR, set, music. We had like four months before the show and we were like, okay, this was good, this wasn't good. We want to do this, how we do this. And everyone was very clear that the goal was to create a show that it's worth spending time and money on it. Uh, and everyone, work really hard on it. So when this video is out, when the photos are out, and essentially when the collection is out, mm -hmm. it kind of makes sense and everyone is, okay, this, this was hard work, but it's actually worth it. So I'm a bit worried because there's nothing to start a new season. Again, we need to look, at, look back and be like, okay, what didn't work this season? But I hate to say it, it was very close to to being perfect. <laughs> so, do you analyze every previous season before you go forward? Yeah, yeah, you have to because you, you just ask, okay, what went wrong? How can we, how can we make it better and what, where should we move so it looks new and you keep the level? Um, so it's a, the more you do, the better you do. It's, I think it's just gonna become harder and harder. So it's, uh, we're just gonna look and need to find a different perspective to to react to, it's more about reacting to, to something, uh, which is, this was a reaction to the previous show, mm -hmm. um, and it, yeah, it looks 10 times better. Um, the visuals, um, I don't want to devalue my past work because the product that, and the clothes that we did before theirs worked on and developers, those ones, but just the visual that is left to stay with people and forever, it's not the same. So I think that's really learning is yeah, those flat images, yeah. they're the one that actually... They're the takeaway. They're, yeah, they're the one that will stay there for, for the next five, 10 years or whatever. And the video as well, it was very important to, to have this video, which is shows you almost that you, you're there uh, rather than just um, cut yeah. off. You immediately get a sense of... Yeah, I mean, I've been seeing it so much and kind of <laughs> being into it. I, it's hard to judge it from, like, fresh eyes, so... Yeah, you're already on next collection mode. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, even before... We, we finished this a week before the show. So, yeah, we started essentially working on the new collection straight away. And it's, it's very light, it's very building those little layers, because this collection is, there's so many layers to it mm. of the character, my emotion, my respect to, to, to shows and to clothing, then you have the color art references, then you have the techniques, then you have the, the fabrics, the makeup, it's just so many little layers that... So many things to consider. 
Yeah, and just to kind of let it, and there's a point in the season where I have to kind of shut my eyes and be okay, I'm not going to any more exhibition, I'm not looking at any more movies. That, that's it, because you, it's very easy to be yeah. affected. But then sometimes you have really late references that come into the build-up that actually inf- kind of complete the whole, the whole collection. Um, and something you've been holding for a year and a half in your reference book that you're like, it's not the right time, but then it, it's almost like having a safe with ideas and you yeah. open it from time to time, which is, I mean, it's... Pandora's box of ideas. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, there's, there's loads more there, so I'm excited. I'm excited. Well, congratulations on this collection. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kiko. Thank you.